Welcome to Evolution of Pottery in Ancient Egypt. Excavations all over Egypt have uncovered enormous quantities of pottery vessels of all shapes and sizes. The production of pottery was mainly confined to the outskirts of settlements due to the materials required and to keep the kiln smoke away from inhabited spaces. The function of the product determined the selection of the raw material, its treatment, its form, as well as the finishing of the surface. Pottery was essential to ancient Egyptians' daily lives. It was used in all aspects of life, from the storage of grains and liquids to containers within the tombs of necropolises. The most common pottery was made from Nile silt that resulted in a reddish-brown clay. Limestone clay, which made for more attractive pottery, was only found in Upper Egypt. Early pots were made from pinched or coiled clay. Chopped straw, ashes, and other minerals were added, and the mixture was then smoothed and decorated before being put in the oven. Pots were fired in bonfires or enclosed within a brick kiln. The potter's wheel was utilized during the Old Kingdom. Pottery became smoother and more polished, similar to river stones. It was decorated primarily in red pigment, with the black color achieved by exposing it to smoke. Pottery workshops were attached to palaces or temples, and around the late period, specialized workshops began to appear. Quartzite particles, which created the rich blue or green glazing, became common during the New Kingdom. Mediterranean motifs and tin-based glazing came with the Greco-Roman era. Potsherds could be found anywhere and were the most common canvas for writing or drawing in comparison to the more expensive papyrus sheets. Named after their Greek description, Ostraca contained daily life records, letters, or could be drawn upon. Artists drew sketches for temples and tombs, or simply for leisure. Welcome to Sneferu's first pyramid. With the long reign of Sneferu, the first king of the fourth dynasty, the most brilliant and creative period began for the construction of funerary monuments in Egypt. Funerary monument design moved from the step pyramid to the smooth-faced pyramid, testament to the evolution of the practices of construction. The first attempt at this design was the Pyramid of Medum. While Sneferu's monument started as a seven-stepped pyramid, it was later altered into an eight-stepped structure. The final phase of construction saw the steps filled out and an outer casing applied to achieve a smooth surface. The smooth dressing of the walls did not provide sufficient bonding, however, and the outer casing did not rest on sound foundations. As a result, the bases of the four outer buttress walls gave way causing the walls to slide down and collapse. While the Maydoom Pyramid was abandoned due to design flaws, it showcased other innovations that would impact all future pyramid designs.
As well as the smooth sides, it was the first time a ceremonial pavement was built, leading from the valley to the temple of the pyramid. Another innovation was that of the funerary chamber, which was no longer at the bottom of a well, but rather above ground level. This change signaled the beginning of the three-bedroom system. Welcome to the Bent Pyramid of Dashur. After the construction of the Maidum Pyramid failed, Sneferu transferred his residence and the official necropolis to Dashur. There he began construction on his second attempt at a funerary monument. The resulting structure, known as the Bent Pyramid, is the only one of its shape in Egypt. Though the pyramid also proved unstable and was abandoned, it marked a technical and architectural breakthrough. Heralding an important design transition, the bent pyramid displays a shift from the step pyramid to a functional smooth-sided pyramid. The bent pyramid was unique in having two separate entrances, one on the northern face and another on the western face. The chamber of this pyramid was too small for a human burial. It was probably meant for the burial of a statue designated to house the Ka, the vital spirit of the deceased king. With the Bent Pyramid, architects successfully experimented with a completely new idea. To build the pyramid with a core of huge stones settled on a progressive horizontal design. This way, each construction phase could be completed in a single stage, allowing the architect complete control over every design element. Unfortunately, these precautions did not prevent sagging or cracks in the interior rooms of the pyramid. Sneferu abandoned the monument and began the construction of yet another pyramid. Welcome to the Red Pyramid of Dashur. The Red Pyramid was built two kilometers to the north of the Bent Pyramid. It was so named due to the reddish limestone used in its construction. The Red Pyramid reached a height of 105 meters. While the ground level of the Red Pyramid is lower than that of the Bent Pyramid, its height is virtually the same. The task of making the pyramid a geometrical, true flat face pyramid brought about yet another new design concept, the use of casing blocks. The descending corridor of the pyramid, which opens to the north, arrives at ground level, where two almost identical spectacular chambers with high ceilings 
are aligned north to south and connected by a short horizontal passage. In the south wall of the second chamber, accessed by a staircase, another corridor leads to the final chamber, which is built within the masonry of the pyramid itself and aligned east to west. The annexes of the Red Pyramid consist of a small funerary temple located to the east. A causeway presumably ran due east from the temple, but it has yet to be excavated. The Red Pyramid was structurally sound and once finished marked a remarkable design milestone. Finally successful in his attempts to build himself a suitable funerary monument, Sneferu knew his future beyond death was assured. Natron. Natron is a colorless salt that was used by ancient Egyptians for food preservation, cleansing products, and glass making. It was also used in the mummification process. During the ceremonial embalmment ritual, the priests packed the body in natron in order to remove all of the moisture. Once the body was thoroughly desiccated, they could begin the wrapping. Natron was mined in Wadi Natron. The main mining methods involved either cutting slices out of the lake bed when it was dry, or raking through mineral saturated water to gather the mineral salts during the floods. Both techniques are still used today and inspired the team in their recreation of the mines located in the mountains northwest of Memphis. to the Step Pyramid Complex of Djoser. The Step Pyramid is at the center of an enclosed complex comprised of temples, models of palaces, and artificial constructions all built for the afterlife of Pharaoh Djoser. The funeral complex itself covers 15 hectares and is located on the highest point of the Saqqara Plateau. It's clear from the elaborate detail and scale of the complex that this was a technological marvel of its time. The only fragment of information regarding the design plans of the complex was discovered on a section of stone containing an architectural sketch of a vault. The Step Pyramid is the first monument built of stone. 
Standing at 60 meters high, it was the tallest of its time. Built 4,700 years ago, it was originally intended as a mastaba, which was a flat-roofed rectangular tomb. Its famous architect, Imhotep, may have felt this was too humble for the great Pharaoh Djoser and began to add the steps. The step pyramid complex is enclosed within a 1600 meter long wall that is 10 meters high. This large wall was made out of white limestone and oriented along the north-south axis. While there are 14 doors, only its eastern door was intended to accommodate the living. The remaining false doors were built as portals for the king's ka to pass through. Along with false doorways, the walls were designed with bastions and steeples resembling a defensive wall. The positioning of these design elements suggest that they were related to the Hebsed festival. The only real entrance into the complex is at the end of a long, narrow passageway. This enclosure has a stone canopy carved to resemble wooden logs. At the end of the passage is a large opening. Meant to resemble a doorway, it has carved doors and hinges that are permanently open and immovable. The corridor is lined with 20 pairs of columns up to 6 meters high, built by stacking stone drums. The completed facade was made to resemble reed stock bundles. Traces of red paint were found on the columns, along with black paint on the support walls. This would have had the effect of blending the walls into the shadows to give the red columns the illusion of standing on their own. Chambers are located on either side of the columns and are thought to be chapels representing the provinces of Upper and Lower Egypt. According to some Egyptologists, the arrangement of the rooms may be symbolic of jurisdiction and judgment. Guarded by a line of carved snakes, this tomb is located at the southern end of the courtyard. The burial chamber is beneath it, down a 30 meter deep shaft. The low ceiling chamber resembles a mastaba and is relatively intact compared to the later burial chamber. The tomb is made of pink granite, though there is evidence it was once polished limestone. Too small for a body, it is possible that the tomb was intended for the king's ka, or to hold the canopic jars containing the king's organs. Later traditions in burials would have the canopic jars in the same chamber as the body. A polished limestone staircase leads west from the tomb to underground apartments. Some of these rooms were intended to accommodate the king and his family in the afterlife. Many large jars of pottery were found, including some that still had deposits of beer, milk, and oil inside them. The false doorways are decorated with reliefs of the king taking part in rituals. In these reliefs, he is seen carrying agricultural tools, running, and performing a ritual for the reanimation of the deceased. The architect Imhotep chose stone as a building material in order for the complex to last. Following the completion of the initial mastaba, Imhotep devised a burial of more ambitious dimensions. He set about stacking mastabas on top of each other. 
Evidence shows that the pyramid was enlarged twice by additional cuts into the steps, eventually reaching 62 meters in height and 121 meters by 109 meters at its base. A staircase allowing the pharaoh to enter the divine world was represented by a tiered pyramid, oblong in shape, completely enveloping the original mastaba. The pyramid itself is a solid structure. All of the chambers and tunnels are beneath the structure. Pharaoh Djoser the Sacred was the founder of the Third Dynasty. He ruled for 19 years. During his reign, he was known as Horus Najeriket, divine of the body. He was given the name Djoser several centuries after his death as a sign of respect and he is regarded as one of the greatest pharaohs of Egypt. An apocrypha was drafted in his name during the Ptolemaic period, 2,500 years after his death. Djoser was associated with the sky god Horus in his human form. A plinth near the steppe pyramid is inscribed with his name and associated with Horus. He was the first to reside in Memphis, making it the central hub of government for the region. Djoser was known to have built many temples and monuments before the complex at Saqqara. The funerary complex was the first of its kind and would mark Djoser's greatest architectural achievement. The funerary complex was built to resemble Djoser's palace, with the stone carved to imitate mud brick, trees, and reeds. Creating these details and softer textures in hard stone would have been a time-consuming, labor-intensive task. Much of the complex is designed to accommodate the Hebsed festival, allowing the king the ability to affirm his rule even in the afterlife. In the corner is a temple referred to as T. This temple is among the most mysterious structures in the complex. Its outer facade is plain, while inside it is decorated with intricate jed pillars and carvings. It's possible that this place was intended to be where the Ka of the King materialized, symbolically visiting the platform of the Hebsed courtyard from the afterlife. The Hebsed festival enabled the pharaoh to maintain universal order and renew godly powers. Through a series of trials and religious rites, such as dance, offerings, and visiting the sanctuaries of various deities, the ruler's vital force and divine nature was confirmed. The celebration was meant to represent the ruler's jubilee and would take place every 30 years, though the deadline was not always followed. The earliest known ritual dates from the first dynasty. Within the complex of Djoser, southeast of the pyramid, is a dedicated space for this essential ritual to be performed by the king even in the afterlife. The Hebsed courtyard is lined with false chapels and equipped with a platform featuring two staircases meant to represent Upper and Lower Egypt. Located in the courtyard, the two pavilions are believed to represent the palaces of Upper and Lower Egypt. Rectangular in shape, the two replica structures face one another. Their facade is similar to the chapels of the Hebsed ceremony, with column crowns carved to look like falling leaves. 
Because Queen Hetepernepti and Princess Inetkas's names were discovered on a stela near the pavilions, it is thought that these funerary chapels were intended for them. The funerary temple is on the north side of the complex, facing the stars where the deceased ruler was believed to travel after death. Within this temple was the pharaoh's serdab, or cellar. It is a small, enclosed space with one wall sloped to match the first step of the pyramid. The north wall has two observation holes. A statue of Djoser is seated on the throne, wearing a mantle and a tripartite wig with a crown known as a nemes. Representing the king's ka, this statue looks through the observation holes into the courtyard, enabling the king to observe the ceremonies and receive offerings in the afterlife. Welcome to Inside Djoser's Step Pyramid. The architect of the Step Pyramid, Imhotep, was a man of great importance to Pharaoh Djoser and ancient Egyptians in general. The base of a statue of Djoser, discovered in 1926, celebrates Imhotep as a carpenter, sculptor, stonemaker, and chief of the seers. Little is known of Imhotep's day-to-day -day life. While he is credited for writing medical texts, it is for his role of architect that he is most famously known. From the design of the pyramid to the elements within the complex itself, Imhotep set out to create something that would immortalize his king. An architectural achievement, the step pyramid was made from stone blocks instead of mud brick. It was the first time Egyptians built a monument of that height. Imhotep explicitly intended for the stone to reflect natural materials. The funerary complex of Djoser remained famous throughout the centuries and millennia, and its great architect, Imhotep, was deified by ancient Egyptians during the late period. In addition to the central subterranean palace built for Djoser, 11 wells were dug. Each went to a depth of 33 meters and connected with a horizontal gallery extending for about 20 meters. The first five galleries were intended for members of the royal family. Two passages lead underground and branch off in three directions to various magazine galleries. This vast underground space accommodated sections for storage and ceremonial offerings. 
One of the tunnels, starting on the east side of the pyramid, contained 40,000 stone vessels, many of them belonging to the king's ancestors. chamber of Djoser is located at the bottom of a 28 meter deep central shaft. According to Egyptologist Jean-Philippe Lauer, the chamber was originally made from polished blocks of limestone, while its ceiling was decorated in five-pointed stars. At some point, however, the limestone blocks were replaced entirely by pink granite blocks, leaving behind only fragments of limestone blocks decorated with stars. At the foot of the chamber are many tunnels going in all directions. This maze of tunnels, galleries and chambers stretches over five kilometers. There are a number of dead ends and false doors. They may have been intended for the afterlife rather than to fool thieves. Unlike the Great Pyramid of Giza or Menkara, the Pyramid of Djoser does not have any extra openings dug out by thieves. There was no need for them. Because of the easy access into the tunnels and along the corridors, thieves had little trouble clearing out the temples once inside. It is unknown when the mummy of Djoser was stolen. All that remained was a left foot, found by French Egyptologist Jean-Philippe Lauer in 1934. This architect, who devoted his whole life to meticulously exploring the complex, believed it belonged to Djoser. The Pharaoh's apartments, also known as the Blue Chambers, are decorated with blue-green tiles meant to imitate the reed matting that covered the walls and windows of his palace. The stone is carefully curved and painted to look like the rolled mats of open doorways and curtains. There are two long rooms running side by side along a north-south axis. The south room has false doors separated by stone panels, while the north room is a corridor which allows access to side chambers. Nearby chambers originally housed the pharaoh's treasures. The door frames are made of fine limestone and carved with the king's name. As in the south tomb, reliefs are carved into the doorways. These reliefs show the king performing rituals and visiting divine sanctuaries for all eternity. Their interiors are fictive additions made by the team to add to the wonders of the tomb. It is clear from the elaborate detail and scale of the complex that this funerary monument was a technological marvel of its time. Mm -hmm. 